Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all for getting up this early in the morning to hear this uh, interesting, I hope, and exciting talk. And I want to, uh, before I get started, want to thank Nancy for the introduction. I'd like to thank Reed Tracy and Louise Hay for allowing me to be here and participate with them in this program. And I especially want to thank all of you, because all of you are here for a very important reason. You're all part of the new evolution. And I want to talk about the new evolution because we're facing it right now. And it's very interesting because it's one of those stories of good news, bad news. So let's start, let's start with the bad news first. The, the bad news is civilization as we know it is about to end. And the good news is civilization as we know it is about to end. <laughs> Science has given us a very uh, important fact that we should be mulling over, and that fact is this, that in the history of this planet, there have been five times where life essentially got wiped out and started all over again. We call these events mass extinction events. And what's very interesting is that science has recognized that we are now deep into the sixth mass extinction. The five previous mass extinctions were due to things like asteroids or comets hitting to the Earth, uh, global freezing, uh, issues with volcanoes, etc., like that. But what science has found out is that the extinction that we're facing right now, where we're losing species faster than ever before, think about this, since 1950, we lost 90% of the fish in the ocean, the large fish in the ocean. 90% are already gone. That what we're talking about is an ocean in 30 years that will not have fish in it. And that's almost like a science fiction kind of story. And so these are the kinds of things that are going on in our world. Well, what's interesting is not not only are we facing this mass extinction, but science has recognized what the cause of this mass extinction is, and it turns out to be human behavior. That we are actually undermining the environment, changing habitats, polluting the world, causing global climate change, and we are responsible for this unfolding. And a lot of people think, oh, humans can't change the earth like that, and the fact is, oh, yes, we can. And what I'd like to show you, for example, is something that you might remember very recently, the catastrophe in the Gulf. What's so very interesting about this catastrophe, unfortunately, is that humans have a short-term memory problem, that it only took about three days after the cap was put on that we already forgot about the big catastrophe in the Gulf. And the fact is, no, all the hundreds of millions of gallons of oil are still under the water and still polluting everything down there anyway, and yet we can't see it on the top, so it's all cleaned up. Well, that, of course, that's been a big major catastrophe by human engineering, but here's another one. This is a satellite picture in Hungary uh, showing where there's an aluminum plant on the right-hand side, and that big running of red through the valley was there was a big reservoir of toxic waste from the aluminum plant. And this is called the Red Sludge Flood. What was relevant about this flood? When this Red Sludge Dam broke and it made a 12-foot wall of toxic waste run down the hill into the Markal River. Here's what was interesting. 57 miles of the river, that's how long it is, 57 miles, all life in the river was eliminated as a result of the toxic sludge entering the water. And one, one day, 57 miles of river, all life was killed in it by human waste experiences. The story that I love to tell, though, is the one about the Aral Sea. When I was young, I remember in school the mnemonic of studying these seas in Central Asia, and there was called the ABC Seas. It was the Aral Sea, the Black Sea, and the Caspian Sea, and how easy it was to remember ABC. But now I have to tell you, my grandson, when he goes to school, is going to have an easier job because all he has to study are the B and the C Seas. And the the reason why is the Aral Sea that we're familiar with, like you've seen it up there on the map, uh, here's a satellite picture of where the sea is, but actually this is what it looks like today. The Aral Sea is gone. The entire sea, fifth largest inland sea in the world, disappeared because farmers in Russia diverted the water that was feeding the sea to feed cotton plants in a desert. 
And the significance, not only did they disturb all the water flow into that, but then with all the toxic chemicals that they put on the cotton plants, all that seeped into the Aral Sea. 16 species of fish that were peculiar or special for that sea have completely been eliminated. They are now extinct. The significance about all this is that the Aral Sea was at one time a, a source of food for millions and millions of people. It had a tremendous fishing fleet on it. And here's what the fishing fleet looks like today when the Aral Sea looks like that. There's the fishing fleet. And the relevance about that is human behavior has completely destroyed or undid the entire environment for this uh, sea to exist. Now, why is this relevant? Because what we're finding out is these events like this are really causing the demise of our own civilization. And the falling of civilization, this is not the first time this has ever happened. Civilizations have been here before and civilizations have gone. We talk about the Roman civilization and the disappearance of it. Yes, in fact, there was a Roman civilization just like we have a civilization right now and it disappeared. Matter of fact, if I go over the history of Western civilization, you can see that there were several major civilizations in the West that have come and gone. 10,000 years ago, we had animism, which is like the Native Americans. Then that gave way to polytheism like the Romans, the Greeks, the Egyptians. And then those civilizations crashed, and the last civilization before the current one was called monotheism. That's when the church was running the world, and that's when a whole completely different understanding of life. But the church's civilization ended in 1859 when Charles Darwin created a theory of evolution because people started to buy the truth from the scientists rather than the truths they had been buying from the church. So right now we're in the stages, uh, final stages of something called scientific materialism. This is the worldview that we live in right now. Well, the significance about this is, yes, civilizations come and go because civilizations have a life cycle. Civilizations have a life cycle like humans have. And we can talk about the life cycle of a civilization and put it in regard to time. And we can say that a civilization is born, it matures, and then at some point after maturation, the civilization goes into decline and then dies out. So yes, people and civilizations as living organisms have come and gone. And what's interesting is a civilization is like a human. In other words, the first phase of the civilization is a period of development. This is a period where the people in that civilization are trying out all new ideas about how to live in the world and what's the best way to survive and thrive in their environment. At some point, though, we start to get the idea, we start to know how it works, and then we create a rigidity of our beliefs when we get mature. The civilization is mature, and we get rigid beliefs. In fact, if you look at this, this is almost like a parent and a child. Think about this, that a child is in a stage of development trying out all kinds of new things, new ways of living, exciting things to do in their life. And while the child is in that developmental phase, where's the parent? Well, the parents in the rigid stage. And that's where the parents say, no, you have to do it my way. This is the way to do it. So there's a developmental period and then there's a rigidity. But here's the problem. The universe we live in is totally dynamic. Nothing stays the same. It's always changing. So how can you have a rigid belief system in a universe that is continuously changing? What ultimately happens is this. Rigid beliefs lead to challenges because they can't adapt to the ever-changing environment. The challenges then actually provoke a change in that civilization, and ultimately what it leads to is a decline of the civilization, and as that civilization goes into decline, it dies out. Well, what's really interesting about it is this. We are right now in a stage of not just challenges, we are in a stage of crisis. We're in a stage that says this. We are being told we're going extinct. We're being told before the end of the century this is going to happen. Now, the whole idea about this is you have two choices. Sit there and go, wow, let's party like it's 1999, and we'll just go out with the wind like that. Or we can do something, we can make a choice, we can be engaged, and we can change our world. And that's where the change comes from. So we're evolving not out of a matter of choice, we're evolving as a necessity as a result of crises that are threatening our immediate survival. And what's interesting is when you have these crises like that, they're the result of the way we're thinking. And I love a quote from Albert Einstein. He says, we can't solve the problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created the problem. So basically what Einstein was saying was this, as we face the problems that we're getting into right now, we have to recognize 
the thinking we've been living with is the cause of the problems that we're facing. And as a result, we pull out of the old thinking and start to do new thinking. Those people that pull out and start to think in a different way are the foundation of the next level of civilization. Arnold Toynbee, the sociologist, called these new thinkers creative minorities. Another word that's more familiar is new thinkers are called cultural creatives. These are the people that are thinking about the new way to survive into the future. And here's the most fun part. If you're in this audience today, by definition, you are the cultural creatives of the new civilization. Thank you for being in this audience. And when you take these new ideas and we start to create a new world out of them, this is our opportunity to survive. Because if we don't do any changing, we already know where the system is going. And I say, well, what is it that causes or gives the civilization its characteristic beliefs? What is it that shapes the behavior of a civilization? And here's a simple answer. It's quite wonderful. Since time immemorial, 10,000 or more years ago, earliest people in civilization had very basic questions of life. They're called the perennial questions. The perennial questions are, how did we get here? Why are we here? And now that we're here, how do we make the best of it? Well, why this becomes important is this. Now, listen to this. The answers to the questions constitute what we call the basal paradigm. Basal means fundamental. Paradigm means idea blueprint. So its point is this. Whatever answers we accept for the questions shape the character because we build our behavior based on what the answers tell us. And the significance about this is two profound points now. Number one, whoever we buy the answers from, they become the truth provider of the civilization. Whoever we get the answers from, we also go to them to seek all the other knowledge that we want to know about the world that we live in. And number two, the answers that we do get are fundamental in shaping the behavior that we live with on this planet because we accept these answers as the mechanisms of, of life. Well, the responsibility for all this lies on the fact that we buy these belief systems. And when we buy these belief systems, we create behavior and truth providers. So just to, to go backwards, for example, let's talk about the previous civilization, which was called monotheism. Monotheism was the culture that lived by the following answers to the questions. How did we get here? divine intervention. That's the picture on the Sistine Chapel of God and Adam and the two fingers coming together. God infused us with life. Why are we here according to that monotheistic approach? And the answer was, we're here to live out plays of morality. The monotheist belief is this, that this is a way station to some place better. The other place, wherever that is, is not here, but it's up there somewhere where God and his firmament's lying around someplace, and they want us to believe in that civilization that living on the earth is just a test to see if you can go to the other place or not. And so basically, we're living out plays of morality. In fact, they so emphasized the spiritual plane that they talked about the earth and the physical realm that we live in as actually deterrence to go to that physical plane. The church used to tell people, listen, it's your material possessions that are keeping you here on the planet when you basically should be not concerned with the material realm, you should be concerned with the spiritual realm. The church tried to help out, of course. What they did is they said to everybody, look, give us all your physical possessions and we will help you get to the other place. Basically, with the understanding that if we got to this other place, then we say, well, how would we live on this world in living out our plays of morality to see if we're worthy to go to the other place? And the answer they provided us with is live by the laws of the scripture. And so basically they said, here's how you live on the planet. You're only here, though, just for a test because we really want to see you go to the other place. But while you're here, follow the laws of the Bible. And this civilization lasted for a period of time, actually until Charles Darwin. And the reason why is when Charles Darwin came around and gave us a theory of evolution, people accepted the answers from science over the suggestions of how we got here from the church. The church gave us the Genesis story, the magic show, seven days, and all of a sudden they put some humans on the top of the planet when it was all done, and here we are. And then 
science came. And in 1859, science gave us the answers that were different. And the answers from Darwin in this period of what is called scientific materialism, the answers from Darwin gave us a new way of looking at life. Because according to Darwin, how did we get here? Random genetic mutations. You go, well, how come people accepted that over Genesis? And the answer was very simple. Back in 1859, before there were Game Boys and TVs and movie theaters and all that, what did people do for entertainment? Well, they bred animals and plants. Well, the relevance about that, it was Darwin who said, when you breed two parents, the offspring have all the traits of the parents, and every now and then you get a weirdo in the offspring, in the litter. And what Darwin was saying is, what if you took those weirdos and bred them and bred them on and on, you would get new species. Well, for people who were raising plants and animals, that seemed like quite logical and obvious, more so than the story of God created it one day and there it all was. So people let go of the answers from the church. When the church provided the answers, the church was our truth provider. You want to get some answers about life? You go to the guy in the black coat and he would tell you the answers. But after 1859, we changed the answers. We bought into the Darwinian theory that we got here through random mutations. And he said, but why are we here, according to science? And science had to go like, hey, look, it was an accident. These are random mutations. Uh, since it was an accident, then there's absolutely no reason why we're here. So it's just a coincidence, and congratulate yourself for being the recipients of lucky genes that allowed you to be here uh, at this moment. And then a science came up with, how do you live on the planet? Well, this is where the profound change comes from. Because the church told us how we live on this planet. We live by the laws of the Bible. But once science came in, they gave us a new way of looking at how you live on this planet. And basically it says that you live by the laws of the jungle, meaning this, that life is a struggle, that every day you go out there and all the other organisms are trying to beat you to get ahead of you. So it says that you're in a continuous, eternal struggle for survival and that you go out there and you fight, fight, and fight for this competition. Well, what's really interesting about this, science told us that we have to go out and fight for the survival but science doesn't have any morality to it. Science just says you win if you're alive at the end. So basically, science says we know what the end is, survival. But the means, how do you get to that survival? Well, science doesn't care how you get to that survival. You could use your brain and be somebody like Einstein. You could be Mozart. Or you could be some jerk with an Uzi and shoot everybody down. All three of those would be considered winners in the competition. So basically, when we entered the world of science, we lost the world of morality. Because science doesn't tell you how to get there except fight and fight and see if you can survive through this competition. Well, the interesting understanding is this. When science took over the basal paradigm, then the truth provider was no longer the church because the truth provider for a civilization who is, is that entity that gives us the answers. So before we used to go get our answers to questions of life by going to the guys in the black frocks. Today we get our answers by going to the guys in the white frocks because now the scientists provide us with answers what's true about the world that we live in. Well, here's the problem. When the answers to the questions change, listen to this, it's a fact of life. Every time when the answers to the questions change, the civilization changes to accommodate the new answers and new behavior associated with those answers. Well, yes, we're facing the end of our survival right now. We already know our extinction's written right on the wall. And the reason why, I'm gonna tell you right now. Four fundamental truths that we bought from science and built our life on, the way uh, that we you know, guide our world and guide ourselves in the world, we bought the answers from science. Well, let me tell you a fact. There have been four truths that we bought, and these truths are now found to be totally flawed or totally outright wrong. And you say, but why is that relevant? I go, well, if you build a lifestyle based on these truths and the truths are wrong, then you obviously compromise your life. So I refer to these four misperceptions as myth, and I'm not speaking with a lisp, myth perceptions. And the reason why is this. These are myths that we bought to be absolutely true science. 
And it turns out they're not true at all. In fact, they're completely wrong. And I say, yeah, but if you built your life based on these truths and now they're wrong, then you see we have to change the way we're living. And that's exactly what the world is calling upon us to do. Mother Earth, Gaia is saying, you better turn around where you are right now and do something different or you won't be here. Because Mother Earth is suffering from a bad case of humans right now. And she's trying to shake them as best she can off the back. But uh, let's talk about these four myth perceptions. The four myth perceptions are this. Number one, biological processes employ Newtonian physics. And you go, okay, what the heck does that mean? So I go back and I tell you what. Before science, the church was our truth provider, and the church told us that the universe was run by God and invisible forces, spirit, and that we were sort of like marionettes being controlled by invisible forces above us. But Isaac Newton, looking at the universe and looking at the movement of the planets, tried to say that, you know, rather than a, an invisible spiritual mechanism, he said that the universe looks like a machine. Matter of fact, it looks like a clock. Matter of fact, you can tell time by watching the movements of these planets moving around the solar system. So what did Isaac Newton do? He created a mathematics to study the movement of the planets. And they put into those equations physical things like the mass of a planet, how fast the planet was moving, the direction and vector of that movement. And then what did he do? He was able to accurately predict the movements of the universe. And you go, well, that's nice. I go, it's a little bit more than nice because science is based on predictability. Science says if you can predict it, then you understand it. And so basically, why was Isaac Newton so important in this understanding? Because here's what the fact was. Isaac Newton did not put God into the equation. Isaac Newton didn't put spirit into the equation. He said, you can understand the universe by just looking at the physical universe. So don't need to invoke invisible forces. The universe is a machine. Well, if that's true, then understand this. As a machine, then it's the physical mechanical parts that are important. That's exactly what Isaac Newton was reading when he was looking at the planets. So when science stepped in versus a previous stage when monotheism was running the show, monotheism was emphasizing spirit as the drive force. And science comes in and says, forget that spirit stuff. It's not really relevant to understand the machine. Isaac Newton writes the equation. He doesn't put God into the equation. He doesn't put spirit in the equation. And he understands the nature of the universe. So basically says, you can understand the universe without God, without spirit. It's just a machine, but it's based on the material plane. In other words, the new science says, ignore the invisible, but focus on the visible world. Focus on the, the hard mechanical understanding. Well, everything in the universe is a machine. That includes the human being, and that's why medical profession looks at the body as a mechanism, like a vehicle, like a car. When you have a broken down part in your car, then they replace the parts, and basically your body is a machine like everything else in the universe. But what about the mind? Well, before Isaac Newton was Rene Descartes. Rene Descartes came up and said, yeah, there's a mind and there's a body. Yeah, but the mind is not a physical substance. The mind is an energy. And so in Isaac Newton's world, energy and invisible forces are not relevant. So in science, after Isaac Newton, you separate the mind from the body and that you ignore the vital forces, the energy is relevant. And then you look at the body as just a physical machine, take the mind out of the picture. What's really interesting is science said, well, let's study the physical realm, the human body. And science said the mind, oh, that's the invisible metaphysical stuff. Give the mind to church. So religion worked on the mind and medicine worked on the body and everybody was happy. And that caused a detente between evolving science and the formidable power of the church, which was controlling the world. Science said, we won't step on your territory. We leave you with all that invisible stuff. You, you can have that. We'll call that metaphysics. We'll study physics, which is the real science. So there was a separation. I said, well, what is the consequence? What does it mean to you and me if we buy the story that uh, the world is a physical mechanism, as Newton says? How does it affect our culture? Well, number one, it goes like this. We focus on the material realm. That that's all there is. We don't talk about the invisible stuff. We ignore all that stuff about spirit and all that information. We focus on the material plane, that that's where everything is. That we actually, in a world based on Darwinian theory, which we'll talk about, where we're in a competition for survival, then the question is this. If you live in a world of competition for survival, how would you know where you stand in the competition? Where are you in the hierarchy? Well you mix that with a Newtonian vision. 
And you say, what? Newtonian vision says matter is what's important. So guess what? We live in a world where we take matter as an amount of stuff that tells us how we stand in the competition. The more matter you have, the higher you are in the hierarchy. The more you can plunder the earth and take stuff out of the earth and create Humvees and big cars and all that kind of stuff, the more matter you have, the more prestige you have, the higher you are in a hierarchy of competition. And so what have we done? We've destroyed the planet in order to show how powerful we are with all the material things we got. And that's all of a sudden one of the major causes of why the earth is falling apart. We also become disconnected from the spiritual realm. We call it, oh, that's just that extraneous stuff and don't worry about it. It has nothing to do with my physical reality. I am here. I am a machine. Give me enough money and parts. That's all I need. I don't care for anything. And so we disconnect and we lost spirituality as not being relevant in a scientific world. That we find that we are robotic devices and a machine, that we are genetically controlled robots. And why is that relevant? Because it takes your personality out of it. It takes your spirit out of it. And it says, you're just a, a meat machine and you're made out of genes and anything's wrong with you. Is something wrong with your physical machine? And that's why we use drugs. And I go, well, wait, is that absolutely true? When you and I went to school, we saw the atom as that structure on the left, marbles, ball bearings, little tiny solar system. It made sense in a physical universe to have a physical atom. And this is what we saw was the smallest part of the universe, an atom. But guess what? Around 1925, scientists figured out something. When they looked inside the atom, there wasn't any structure. The new atom called the quantum atom is what you see on the right side of the screen. And there's nothing wrong with the picture because it shows us here's what's important about quantum physics. The atom is made out of energy. If you look inside the atom, there's nothing physical in there. It's basically little nano tornadoes of force fields. So there's nothing physical in an atom. And you go, wait a minute. Wait, let me get this right. There's, atom is not physical. I go, yeah, but don't atoms make molecules? And I go, yeah. But then molecules, the big combinations of atoms, then they're made out of energy too. Yeah, I go, yeah, that's right. I say, but molecules make cells. Yeah, but that's true. So cells are actually made out of energy. And I go, yeah, and cells make us. And what you're looking at are energy beings. It's only the trick of the light that you actually physically see yourself because it's only the light reflecting off of the energy. And the relevance about this spirituality becomes important because when we talk about physicists and we say, what do you call that energy? The energy that makes up atoms, the energy that the atoms are sitting in. We're immersed in a sea of energy. If you could see it, we'd be like in water of energy. It's all energy all around us. And I say, well, what do physicists call it? And I say, they call it the field. Physicists say the energy is called the field. I say, what does the field mean? And I give you the definition. The field represents invisible moving forces that shape the physical world. I go, the field, invisible moving forces that shape the physical world? Where did I hear something like that before? And I go, oh wait, the word spirit. I know what that means, invisible moving forces that shape the physical world. And what we're beginning to find out right now is quantum physics and spirituality have come back to the same table and the same plane. We're back to the same reality that it's the energy that's important. So science and spirituality are coming together at a very necessary time to give us a truth that we are spirit, we are the field, and we are all of that energy all together. I say, what's the role of that invisible force? Well, I'd like to illustrate it with a simple experiment. I take a piece of iron in a file, and I file that piece of iron, and I cut it, make a little pile of iron dust, which we call iron filings. And I take those iron filings, put them in a salt shaker, and sprinkle it on a piece of paper, and I get a random pile of iron filings. And if I throw away that pile and sprinkle it again, I get another random pile of iron filings. Every time I sprinkle the iron filings, just a random pile. But then I do something different. I buy a magnet and I put a magnet underneath the piece of the paper. Now when I sprinkle the iron filings, look what I get. I get this beautiful structure called the image of the magnetic field. I say, throw away those iron filings, sprinkle it again. What do I get? I get the same pattern. Every time I do it, I get the same pattern. And I say, but where does the pattern come from? And the answer is very obvious. When I just sprinkled the iron filings, there was no pattern. But when I put the iron filings in a magnetic field, when I put it in a field, that's when the structure shows up. So it's matter plus field equals structure. 
What's the simple point about this is, it's the invisible energy fields that give shape to the material world. You are an energy field and you're being given shape to your body through your field. You are an energy field. And the relevance about that is then we're all part of that big thing called the field, the energy of all, the all that is. You are part of God. You can never be separated from God. You are all that is. That's what the whole point about it. And as much as you were disempowered a long time ago when the church said you couldn't get to that spirit, you couldn't get there without them being in the middle, guess what? The same thing happens today in science because science, the medical people tell you, guess what? Your health is a physical issue. It had nothing to do with you. And the fact is, it has everything to do with you. It's your field. It's your belief, your thoughts, your energy that shape your physical body and your life. And both science and religion took away something that we innately had and then sold us back a shoddy copy. We never got as much spirit from the church as we already had to begin with. We don't get as much health from health care as we already have innately available to us in the first place. It's time for us to re-empower ourselves. And it's interesting because here's a quote from my friend Albert Einstein. And he said, the field is the sole governing agency of the particle. What is the particle? Matter. So what is the, the field is the sole governing agency of matter. In other words, when you look at this physical world, when you look at yourself in the mirror, when you look around at the universe that we live in, it's really the energy field that gave shape to that. And we have to honor the field because we left that out of the equation in a Newtonian world. So I go back to Newtonian physics, I say, yeah, that's the one with the body only. I say, what about the mind? I go, not in Newtonian physics, but guess what? In quantum physics, the mind not only shows back up as an energy field, but more importantly, the mind is put back in its top order. It's above your body. It's your mind that controls your body. Matter of fact, go back to Albert Einstein's quote. The field is the sole governing agency of the particle, or in this case, the mind. The mind is the sole governing agency of the body. That is the physics of the whole story. And when you understand the nature of how you control your mind, that's when you understand the nature of how to control your life. It's all in your mind. And I go, well, that's real interesting because quantum physicists in 1930 had an understanding of that. This is a quote from Sir James Jean, one of the founders of the quantum theory. And in 1930 he wrote, listen to this, very simple, the stream of knowledge is heading towards a non-mechanical reality. The universe begins to look more like a great thought than a great machine. If he goes on to write, he says, mind no longer appears to be an accidental intruder into the realm of matter. We ought to rather hail it as the creator and the governor of the realm of matter. So in other words, according to quantum physics, the world exists because of your mind and the field that you generate and your consciousness from it. Another physicist at the very same time wrote, it is difficult for the matter-of-fact physicist to accept the view that the substratum of everything is of mental character. It's basically said the universe is a mental field experiencing itself as a physical reality. More recently, just a couple of years back, in the journal Nature, now that's one of the main prestigious journals of science, there was an article by a physicist, Richard Con Henry. The article's called The Mental Universe. I don't need you to read the article. You know what, I just want to show you the last two little short sentences. This is right out of the article. The universe is immaterial. It's mental and spiritual. Live and enjoy. Basically, the physicists have been telling us since 1930 that this whole world is a mental creation, that your thoughts are shaping the world. And if your thoughts are incorrect and you've been programmed incorrectly, then you create a very disturbing picture of the world that we live in. When you reorganize your thoughts, put them in harmony with life and the planet, then you can return to health and the planet can return to health as well. So the beliefs that we bought that Newtonian physics told us about, the physical realm, the concept of genetic robots, all that stuff, that disappears. Because the new truth is quantum physics. I say, if you live into the world of quantum physics, the one we're moving into, how would I change the behavior with the new belief system? And here's what it comes out. If you live in the world of quantum physics, number one, recognize this. There's a unity of polarities. It's called holism. Yes, there's male and female, but in the world of 
quantum physics, there's a unity of that understanding. That there's a world of conservatives and liberals. Yes, yeah, but in that world of quantum physics, all of that is in the same world as well. That we live in a world of what appears to be dualities, and yet the fact is, all the dualities are in the same world. Everything is part of the same world. When we start to recognize this, then the polar activation that causes one person to go against another person disappears in a world with no polarity. And this is what we have to understand, that we're all part of one thing called holism that we have to accept that the invisible forces are shaping the world that we live in. While we keep looking at the mechanical unfoldment of life, we have taken our eyes off of the thing that was most important. It's the invisible stuff. It's your thoughts that shape the world. It's how you are thinking that creates your biology and the life that you are experiencing. And then we have to recognize this, as the physicists have told us, it's right in the physics, your consciousness is co-creating your life. You are not a passive victim in a world gone out of control, you are an active creator. But unfortunately, you've been creating for other people's belief systems. Now it's time to get the beliefs back and create from a new foundation, a new ground of how truly powerful you are. Because each one of you is a spiritual creator of the life of which you are experiencing. <laughs> Myth perception number two. A belief that we've been living by is the belief that genes control our biology. This is that story ever since 1953 we bought it. I remember 1953, the day that uh, Watson and Crick discovery was reported in the newspaper, the entire front page of my newspaper in New York, big block print letters right across the entire page, secret of life discovered. That the DNA story filled in the last piece of the material universe and said, you are coming from your DNA. Your DNA contains your traits, your characteristics, and determines the character of your life. And we bought into that belief system. And I said, yeah, but what's the relevance of you buying into the belief that genes control your life? Well, here's the number one big issue. As the Life Magazine article illustrates, were you born that way? What does it say? It says that your traits, your behavioral traits, your emotional traits, your physical traits, all these traits are controlled by genes. And well, why is that relevant? Well, first of all, it's not controlled by you. It's controlled by genes. I say, yeah, but where did the genes come from? Well, they say, oh, at the moment of birth, <laughs> some genes came together in that egg and sperm and created your life. I go, well, as far as you know, did you pick these traits, these genes, as far as we know? No. I say, yeah, but if, if you don't like the traits that you got, that you have cancer running in your family, Alzheimer's running in your family, diabetes running in your family, and these got these genetic traits, and I say, did you pick them? You go, no, I, no, I didn't pick them. I say, D can, you, can you change them if you don't like them? And they go, no, no, I can't change them. Well, wait, you didn't pick the things that control your life? You can't change the thing that controls your life? What does that make you? It makes you a victim. You're a victim of heredity. It's sort of like, well, listen, it's just running in my family. Now I have to live with it. You know, my father died when he was 51. My grandfather died when he was 49. I'm 52. I think I'm over the limit already. I should expect to die any day now. <laughs> And this is the belief that we hold. We behold the belief that we are held captive and victim by our own genes, that it's running in the family. When you buy that, then what does it mean? What does it mean in the world that we live in if you buy that to be absolutely true? It means this, number one, genes control your life that you have no control. You are a passive victim inside a vehicle that goes awry if something goes wrong with the system and you had nothing to do with it. Number two, that genes determine an organism's value. How many times have you heard, oh, that person comes from less powerful genetic stock. You shouldn't go out with that person. He comes from a different genetics. And what we start to recognize is that we start rating people based on their genetics. Why? Because genetics are the physical character trait controlling elements that we were provided with. Okay? And then we also then believe that we are victims of our heredity because we didn't pick the genes as far as no, can't change the genes, genes control who we are, and therefore I'm out of control. I am not in control. You have been programmed to be victims. People told you it's the genes that did that. You had nothing to do with it. Yeah, but when you believe that, what does it do to our world? What does it do to the population when a population believes that the genes control their lives and they have nothing to do with it? It makes them irresponsible. 
We become irresponsible. Why should I even care? The genes are already screwed up my life and it's already over. I just might as well enjoy the rest of it and go out the door. But there's a problem. When you buy that you're a victim, what do you need? Think about it. What do you need if you're a victim? You need a rescuer. And when you have a rescuer available, then you have to pay that rescuer. And when you pay that rescuer, they're there to what? Help you get out of the problems. And I want to tell you something. If you just look at the current situation, in the United States today, we pay twice as much money for health care as almost all the other nations in the world, and we have about the sickest population that exists on the planet. So right away, there's a disconnect between how much money you pay and how much health you get. As a matter of fact, the more money you pay, the less health you get. Maybe that's a little insight and secret you should be looking at as to how you get away with this issue. But we bought it. We bought victim. I'm a victim. I can't do anything about it. Well, guess what? They did the Human Genome Project. It was the last project in biology because they figured we know how it works. The genes control it. All I need is a list of genes. If I get a list of genes, then what I can do is I can have a patient come in the office and say, yep, uh, you got a problem, but I can genetically engineer you with some new genes. Somebody comes in the office and said, you know, I, I don't sing very well. Do you happen to have a Mozart gene in that cabinet? You can give me a Mozart gene. And basically, the concept of genetic engineering entered into our world that we can change you by changing your genetics. So we did the Human Genome Project. And it was interesting because before the project got off the ground, they already knew they needed 150,000 genes minimum. You say, how did they know? And I'll tell you a simple reason. A gene is a blueprint to make a building block of the body called a protein. You have over 150,000 proteins. You need a gene to make a protein. So guess what? Do the math. 150,000 proteins, I must need 150,000 genes. And the most excited people in this were the pharmaceutical industry, because what they said, 150,000 genes means 150,000 new drugs. So they were so excited by the Human Genome Project, because they were going to patent every gene and then use it for research. Well, guess what? They complete the Genome Project. Yes, indeed, they patented every gene. You don't even own your own genes. Pharmaceutical companies own your genes. But you know what's interesting? Mother Nature doesn't like that. Mother Nature doesn't really care for people who do that kind of thing. So what does she do? She threw a monkey wrench in. And the monkey wrench, when the number of genes came in in the final tally, 23,000 genes. We're missing over 125,000 genes. And basically, it turns out 23,000 genes is the same number of genes as some of the lowest, smallest organisms on this planet. So the whole belief that we are genetically superior turns out to be fallacious argument. We have the same number of genes as smaller animals on the planet. Why is this relevant? Because the whole model is wrong. Meaning, if science says you need 150,000 genes, then science has a misunderstanding about how genes work because there's only 23,000 genes. So here are all these scientists caught with their genes down going, oops, <laughs> we made a mistake. But we invested so much money, we're not going to talk about the mistake because we just got way too much money into this stuff right now. So every day you still hear in the newspaper an article, a gene controls this and a gene controls that, and you're a victim because you got this gene. And it turns out all of that is false. There is no foundation for that. That it's a completely new science. The belief that genes control life led to the belief that the nucleus of the cell is the brain of the cell. You say, well, what's the connection? I go, the genes in the cell are almost all in a structure called the nucleus. If the genes control life, then the nucleus represents the control center of life. And so we bought the belief, and it's in the textbooks right now. The nucleus is the brain of the cell because that's where the genes are that control stuff. I go, interesting story. What I say is I remove the brain from an organism, and guess what? As expected, the organism dies. And I go, wait, wait, wait. How about if I go into a cell and remove the nucleus, because the nucleus is the brain? This is a process called enucleation. I did a lot of this in my own research. And I say, well, what happens when you take out the brain of the cell? And the answer is nothing. The cell stays alive, the behavior is unaffected. Many cells can live for two or more months with no genes in it. So the belief that genes are controlling life is a total fallacious argument. Genes control nothing. I'm going to give you a fact. <laughs> genes are blueprints. They are absolutely blueprints. Why is that relevant? So I say go to an architect's office. 
she's working on her blueprints over here, and you lean over her shoulder and you go, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, excuse me, are, are the blueprints you're working on, are they on or are they off? And she'll look at you like, what are you talking about? There's no on and off to a blueprint. Precisely. There is no on and off to a gene. A gene is a blueprint. And all the years you have bowed down at the temple of genes controlling your life when genes had no control. Genes can't control themselves. Genes have no self-actualization. Genes have no on, genes have no off. Genes have no awareness of what's needed, why it's needed, when it's needed. Why is this important? Well, you live in a whole world that says genes control everything. And it turns out genes control nothing. You control the genes. It's your mind and your perception that cause the genes to be selected, activated, and you can rewrite every gene in your body. You can create 30,000 variations of every gene in your body by the way you live your life. And so basically it says when you look at your health, it's not a reflection of your genes. When you're looking at your health, it's a reflection of your life, the way you are living it. It's a mirror for you. If you're not well, it's not because you're organically something wrong. If you're not well, you're not living in harmony with biology. And that's where the bottom line comes from. We are not victims of genes. Genes control nothing. The nucleus is not the brain. And the new science is called epigenetics. And what's the difference? Genetic control literally means control by genes. That's the science we've been living with. And I say, yeah, but what's epigenetic control? I want to say that little epi, that little three-letter prefix, that little prefix on the front, changes the entire world that we live in for this reason. When I say genetic control, that means control by genes. That's what you believed in. You're the victim of your genes. But now I say epigenetic control, I go, what's the epi? Epi means above. When I say the word epidermis, that means the layer above the dermis, which is the skin. So now I say epigenetic control. I say, what does that mean? Control above the genes. Yes, the control is not in the genes. It was never in the genes. The control was in your perception of the world. You change your perception, you change your genetics. You change your belief, you change your health. That's the basis of what we call the placebo effect. It was just that you believed you were going to get well and you got well. You changed the genetics. And while we focus on the placebo effect, this is the error. Why? Because we only talk about, oh, a positive thought could help heal me because I could take a sugar pill, and if I really believe that pill is what's going to heal, heal me, I will take a sugar pill and I will get healed. And everybody goes, yes, yes, ooh, placebo effect. I go, that's right. But then I want to tell you what you have to understand because most people are not aware of it, and I have to emphasize it more profoundly. It's not the placebo effect that's important. It's the nocebo effect. You say, what's a nocebo effect? I say, oh, that's when you have a negative thought. And a negative thought can kill you and make you sick as much as a positive thought can heal you. And why is that relevant? Because psychiatrists and psychologists tell us 70% of our thoughts are negative and redundant. So what does that mean? Every day you're going out with thoughts that are undermining your health. It was your thoughts that undermined your health. Change your belief system, epigenetics, and you will rewrite the genetic expression of your life. You're not the victim of your genes. I go, uh, this stuff that I had in my book, Biology of Belief, is now coming out into the public. There's an issue of Discover Magazine, the title article, the new genetics. DNA is not your identity. Yes, it was epigenetics. It says your DNA is not who you are. You can change your DNA just by the way you live your life. More recently, just in January, Time Magazine comes out with a cover story. Why your DNA isn't your destiny. It's a new story of epigenetics. We are rewriting a belief system that has hobbled you and limited you and led to you actually getting sick. Because if your mind is creating the recognition or reading of your genes, what if I feed your mind that you have a cancer? What if I feed your mind that you have Alzheimer's running in your family and you could get that? And the issue is, 
well, that's all it takes to create Alzheimer's and cancers is the belief of Alzheimer's and cancer. It turns out only 10% of cancer has any hereditary linkage at all. 90% of cancer is lifestyle and the way you're living. And it's interesting because they recently were doing a study of kids adopted into a family with cancer. And what was relevant? They found that the adopted child would get the cancer with the same propensity as any of the natural siblings. I go, yeah, but what's interesting? It's like, oh, what's interesting is the child has completely different genetics. It was coming into the family and learning the behavior that caused the cancer, not the genes that caused the cancer. And that says, and if you change your belief, if you have cancer, what can you do? And the answer is spontaneous remission. All you need to do is change the power of your belief to rewrite your genetics. That's the placebo effect. So I go, okay, myth perception number two. I go, what is the consequence of that? Well, I said, that's the victimization story you bought. I go, yeah, but that's when genetics control, but how about if epigenetics control biology? It changes the way we live on the planet. Why? Number one, it's the mind that controls the genes. You can create 30,000 variations of every gene in your body just by the way you're thinking. So that means you are the powerful one. You're the one that's shaping the genes that you have personal mastery over your life. You're not a victim of forces outside of you. You are creating the life, unfortunately, with the help of others who have given you information about your life that you bought. Now it's time to take back the power because you can change your life. You can create health and harmony when you understand the nature of the mind and how it works because that's where the power comes from. And then, unfortunately, I have to tell you this. this is, people don't want to hear this part. But the part is this, when you understand this new biology, then you understand the need for personal responsibility. Why? You are personally creating your life with your thoughts. And therefore, rather than blaming our issues on genes, family, environment, and all that other stuff, it really comes down that we are the ones that are personally responsible. Now, this creates a problem for a lot of people because I tell you, I say, yeah, but guess what? Your whole life, you were controlling it yourself. And people say, well, they go back over their lives and they go, man, I don't want responsibility for that. There was so much sickness, illness, and so much rage and so much problems. It had to be the genes. It's not me. And then I say, no, it's you. And then a lot of people say, I can't buy it. And what happens? Immediately, what do they provoke in their mind? Guilt, shame victim, blame, and they start to say, I can't, I can't go back and own what I did in my life, so I'm not buying your new story. And now I'm going to tell you, guess what? The past is irrelevant. If you didn't have the knowledge of how it worked, there is no such word as blame, victim, gain, the shame, guilt. None of those words apply. If you didn't know how to drive the vehicle, I can't blame you if the vehicle doesn't work right. It's the driver education we need. So the reality is this. History is irrelevant, but the future is now yours. The future is when you understand how this works, now from today forward, you have responsibility. You have no responsibility in the past. You didn't have any awareness of how it worked. So now it's a change of the way we live in our world. Myth perception number three, evolution is a random process. Well, where do we get that idea? Well, from Charles Darwin's theory, which is now called Neo-Darwinian, the new version of Darwinian theory based on molecules and genes. And there are only two steps in evolution. A, random mutation, followed by B, natural selection. The step A, random mutation, means this. When the cells are dividing, sometimes they make an accident in copying the genetic material, and that causes a mutation. And so it was an accident. It wasn't an intention. So I say, well, how do these mutations occur? Just an accident. Well, if that's an accident, then that means something about how we live on the planet. Because I say, then why are we here on this planet? And it says, there is no purpose for our existence on this planet. It was just a bunch of accidents. And then all of a sudden, what's our relationship to the environment? It says, no, we're not connected to the environment. We just happen to grow up in the environment, but we're not connected to it because we, we got here by accident. That, my dear friends, is the fundamental problem that we're facing on the world today. Because we've undermined the environment and we're destroying the ecosphere. And the ecosphere is what gave rise to us, not by accident, but by intention. We didn't get here by accident. We were programmed to be here for a very specific reason. But you have to understand that evolution is not a random process. Well, this came from a story back in 1988 by a 
British geneticist by the name of John Cairns. What did he show? He took bacteria with a mutation that could, these bacteria couldn't digest the milk sugar lactose. There was a gene that was defective. And they take these bacteria and they put them in a petri dish and the only food they put in the petri dish is lactose. Well, if you're one of those bacteria, you say, thanks, but no thanks, I can't digest this stuff. Here I am in a desert of lactose. I can't use this stuff. And then you think, okay, well, the cells won't grow. They can't grow because they can't get the nutrients out of the lactose. They can't divide, they can't uh, replicate, they can't grow. And yet what he found is on all the petri dishes, cells were growing. He said, how did that happen? And here's what he found out. In a stressful environment, listen to this, in a stressful environment, an organism will selectively alter genes that are associated with the stress. Anything that is particularly connected to a stress, the system will try to alter the genes to eliminate the stress. So what was the point? Bacteria mutated the bad gene back into a good gene, but it didn't just mutate everything. It actually picked which gene it wanted to mutate. The most primitive organism on the planet can select which gene it needs to modify to mutate to accommodate the environment. You say, wow, well, in other words, the organisms didn't have random mutations, they have what are called adaptive mutations. And you go, well, does that apply to us? It says, of course, it applies from bacteria all the way up to the top. And you say, you mean I can cause a cancer because of a stress in my life? And I say, that is the cause of cancer. And basically, I'll give you a, a real interesting one. Think about this, the thinking part is fun. We live in a world that's not equal for men and women. Women get the short end of the stick in this world. And the idea is for many women, they go, man, I wish I wasn't a woman in this situation. I could do much better. And I say, be very careful what you wish for. <laughs> because you can actually cause breast cancer and eliminate that part of you that made you that woman in a world, now all of a sudden you find, guess what, now I'm not a woman in the world anymore, I am a person in the world, but it wasn't what you were looking for. And yet the stresses result in the illnesses. The illnesses that you get are not accidents or coincidences. And what I love about this, where did I first read into some of this stuff as a scientist? Where did I come and read into this? Louise Hay's book called You Can Heal Your Life. The illnesses in the back of the book are not coincidences. The illnesses are connected to the way you are living. So all of a sudden it says, yes, your body and your health is a mirror of your perceptions and your responses to life. You don't like what's happening in the body? Don't change the body. Change your perceptions and your responses to life. So all of a sudden the concept that evolution is a random process turns out, no, it wasn't random. We adapted into the situation. I say, yeah, but what does that mean? Well, and that means then every organism that is in the environment didn't get there by accident. Every organism that's in the environment got there to adapt to an existing situation. Nature introduces organisms into the environment to keep harmony and keep balance. When an environment goes out of balance, what does nature do? Put another organism in to bring in the balance again. But inevitably that will lead to an out of balance and then another organism comes in. But every time nature introduces another organism, she introduces a more powerful, more intelligent organism over the evolutionary process. So the significant understanding is this, we didn't get here by accident, we got here as a direct purpose of keeping harmony and balance in the environment. The Native Americans knew this from day one. They say we were here to tend to the garden, that we were here to take care of the planet. And then I say, and look what we did to the Indians, we killed the Indians and now we killed the planet. And this is the issue that there's still some time to wake up. Unfortunately, thank God, we still have the Native Americans and other indigenous people around the world still here to tell us how to live on this planet, to how to get back into harmony with the environment and become a partner with nature. <laughs> that in this process, nature didn't just make another organism, but nature made more intelligent organisms. And she did that for a very important reason because it gets to the stage of humans, I say, yeah, but look at the awareness we have. You say, what was the function of this awareness? Just to flaunt it and say, look how smart I am. Look what I got on my SAT exam. No, nature doesn't care about that. Nature wants to know this. With the awareness that you've been given, can you create a way of life that does not destroy nature? 
That's all it was about. It says, can we live here with a small enough footprint that we don't destroy the garden? It says, can we live here with technology that supports us? The issue is you look at the technology we have and you find it's the technology that's undermining the environment. We are completely in the wrong direction of our revolution. We should be going out there every day to find how to live on the planet without destroying the planet in which we live. That is our primary mission and directive. That we evolve through community. We evolve through technology. A lot of people say, oh, technology is the problem. Look, what techno look at television. Look what it did to the people and all the different technology and go, here's the point. Technology is not the problem. It's how you use technology where the problem comes from. And in other words, that's our operating problem, not the technology's problem. Technology is necessary and helpful. In fact, here's an interesting point. When you look at yourself in the mirror and see yourself as a single individual entity, that's a misperception. You are a community of 50 trillion cells. So when I say me, I'm actually talking for a community of 50 trillion cells. What I want to tell you about that community, number one is this. They created technology that even humans can't create right now. The cells in your body have created a technology to control their environment. We filter the air, we filter the blood, we take care of the system, repair all the damage, and reconstruct the whole thing. How does that happen? Cells were intelligent. They used their awareness to create a technology. If we could only emulate the cells, then we'd have a greater opportunity of surviving on this planet because they've been here for millions of years and they certainly have a lot to teach us. Myth perception number four, the last one, and this is unfortunately the most important one for right now, because it says that evolution is driven by a survival of the fittest. It was a mistake on the part of Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin built a story on a principle by another guy called Thomas Malthus, who actually had a school of thought called, listen to Thomas's school, it was called the school of pessimism. So that's not really a school I'd like to probably enroll in, but uh, he had a lot of followers. And what was his pessimistic school all about? Thomas Malthus said this, very simple fact. He said, plants don't grow or outstrip the rate of growth of animals. Animals reproduce and double their population all the time, and plants can't do that. And he said, well, what's the point? The point is this. If the animal population keeps doubling and the plant population can't keep up with it, what will inevitably happen? And the inevitable is there'll be more animals than there are plants to feed the animals. Oh, well, then what will happen? Well, then there'll be a struggle and a fight. Who's going to get that food? So basically, Darwin built the whole theory of evolution that said we are in a perpetual eternal struggle to try to get the food to survive by competing with the others and defeating the others in a win-lose battle. And this is the nature of the world that we live in. That says, yeah, I deserve to be successful because I'm higher on the evolutionary scale. I'm more fit than those people that don't have food. That's the belief system that we walk on. And it's all based again, but now not on the random mutation, but on the second one, natural selection. In other words, when you get a mutation, the question is, does the mutation enhance your ability to survive or does the mutation compromise your ability to survive? Why is that relevant? Well, we won't know until you go out and do what? Compete. And when you go out in that competition, that's when we're struggling for that survival of the fittest. And that's what the whole theory is based on. So the survival of the fittest, what has it done for us? It says that evolution is driven by an eternal struggle so that your life can't be easy. If you're out in the world, you're always going to be fighting and fighting and fighting to stay alive. Number two, the fear of losing is what causes competition. The competition leads to violence, and the violence leads to war. And so basically it says what? We get into war and violence and compete with each other because of the fear that if we don't kill them, they, we won't be enough for us. And we built a whole world of conquerors beating the other people with so-called less genetics, that's what they claim, and therefore we built a whole world of a, a, on a struggle and a violent competition. And the competition that we're in is a struggle based on a winner and a loser. All the competitions we're in, there's a winner and there's a loser. That's a Darwinian perspective. What's really important is if you understood the nature of the definition of competition, listen, here's what the original definition is. Competition means to strive together. 
to strive together. That means if people are competing, yes, there's somebody who's going to win the race, but that person that's winning the race is causing number two to try harder to win the race and number three to try harder. Competition causes everybody to try harder, and yet we look at it, who won and who lost, and it was, that wasn't what the point was. And so there's a new understanding, and this is an article, again, out of Nature by Timothy Lenton. Gaia and natural selection. Let me just tell you one sentence. It's all I need to show you. One sentence. Evolution is based upon species cooperation. Evolution is cooperation, not competition. Before humans were here, there was a cooperative thing called the garden. But since humans have been here, we've destroyed the garden. Because why? We're the only ones that are not cooperating with the world. And that is why nature is very much set upon us either learning our ways or eliminating us from the competition game by getting rid of humans on this planet. That's where we are right now, and that's what we're facing right now in the world that we live in. So I go back to our current world where we live by these things and I say, yeah, but what would the future world look like with a new understanding? It would look like this, a world of survival of the fittingest, a, a world of survival of the most cooperative. Those elements that are cooperative are encouraged by nature to be here and we are obviously not part of that right now. So that evolution is based on cooperation and community. You are now in a community right now. And it's really important to understand this, that when the world shakes a little bit more, which it's doing right now, we're in, we haven't hit the real part yet, we're just facing it. The evolution is coming real quickly. But in this process of evolution, let me tell you the secret. Get into community. It's community that will allow you to survive when the world is in a state of upheaval. It's the cooperation of that community that is encouraged by nature. That the community life and the whole planet is driven by love and altruism. Even animals work together to help each other. Lower animals learn that if one helps the other in exchange, that animal will get help back from the group again. All of them know that except for humans. We're the ones that don't know that. But the fact is what? When we start to learn to live in that love, when we start to learn that we do things for others because they will come back and help us, what we put out is returned, then we start to live in a completely different world. That the whole understanding is, as the Native Americans told us, that our evolution is based on our ability to live in harmony and in balance with nature. And that is the one thing that we completely undermine and keep destroying without really recognizing what and why we're doing it. And yet, it's all that stuff that is actually causing us to come to the end. So if I look over the history of our evolution, I could tell you we've gone through different cycles right here. And it's not finished yet because we're about to come to an ending. And yet if I look at the cycles, what I can tell you is something very interesting. As we look at the cycles up here, we can see that we started with animism, where we believed that everything that was matter was also spiritual. The midpoint was the point of balance and harmony. And then we started to emphasize spirituality more. Polytheists created a bunch of gods. Monotheism said only one god, one spirit is not even on this planet. And then when we were in the monotheistic phase, we were so much engaged in the spiritual realm that we actually dismissed the material realm as being a, a, a problem in your life. If you got too infatuated with the material plane, you were not close enough to God. So we were told in that civilization, do not connect to this physical world because it'll take you away from your purpose of what? Going to the other place. We then passed through the midline and we came back on the way down in a place called deism. And you say, what's deism all about? And here's what deism is all about. There was a philosophy back in the 1700s that was called the Age of Enlightenment. I said, what was the Age of Enlightenment? Well, there was a philosophy that people could live in a utopian world, that we could live here and create a garden and live in harmony and love and all that beautiful vision, the age of enlightenment. I say, where did that philosophy come from? I go, oh, well, there were two primary philosophers, John Locke in England and another guy, Jean-Jacques Rousseau in France. And R Rousseau was the one that gave us this utopian world. And I go, where? did Rousseau get the idea of an enlightened utopian world? And here's the fun part, you ready? He studied the American Indians. 
He studied the American Indians, and he called them the noble savage. And he found how the Indians lived in harmony with each other, how there was the United States of Indians 500 years here in this country before the Europeans got here, that they lived in harmony with peace each other, that the people that came here from Europe were following the dream to become the American Indians themselves. They left a world where there was classes. There was an upper class and a lower class. You were born in the lower class, you'd be there for your whole life. You're born in the upper class, you'd be there for your whole life. But what did the utopian new world offer? It said, I don't care what class you were born into, you could come to the new world and make the best you could of your own life without the limitation of birth. And so all of a sudden people started to read about this beautiful life that the Indians had here. And they were so excited they wanted to come over here and they started coming over here from all over the world. And they started to do what? Create a, a new country. And it was based on what belief systems? Well, it was based on the, why did they come here? The Age of Enlightenment. Yeah, but what did the Age of Enlightenment have an understanding about? It said that spirit and matter are one and the same thing, just as the Indians said for hundreds of years before. And that they came over to this country and they started to recognize that nature and God were one and the same thing. Politicians were also scientists. Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, primary deists. They were studying nature to understand God better. They came here to live the life of the Indians. And what did they do? They actually took the whole foundation of the Indian culture and their politics and formed and crafted the American system. And I say, well, what do you mean? I say, well, the Indians had a chief and they had two houses of Congress. And we took exactly those things. Except that here's where the United States went wrong. They carried a little bit of their European stuff with them along. And here's where the problem comes in, because let me tell you what. What did the Indians do that we wanted to model? They elected their chief. I go, yeah, how did the Indians do it? Only the women could vote. <laughs> the women were wise. Yes, the women wanted a powerful leader, but they also wanted a benevolent leader, a kind leader that would support the community, not just who was the strongest one. That's what men elect. Then they formed a House of Representatives, because the Indians had a House of Representatives. And then they formed something called the Senate. And what was the Senate in the Indian world? It was called the Council of Grandmothers. Only grandmothers could be in that council. Why? Because they had the wisdom to declare war, to declare peace, to decide the future of their civilization. And that is why they came here to model the Indians, and yet they brought that European thing about women not being in that status. And they created almost an Indian nation, but the failure of handling the understanding about the power of women, the power of wisdom that women hold, the power of community that women represent, was left out of our government. And the leaving it out of the government left us in a continuous warring world where we elect chiefs that support war. And that's where we live today. And yet, we really have to come back to understand the Native Americans for the simple understanding was this. The Native Americans were the ones that understood that nature and God were one and the same. That in fact, let me just add this while I got the platform for a second, because we're entering a Tea Party time. And the Tea Party people are the ones that say to us that this is a Christian nation, a theocracy. And I want to tell you something. They never read the Declaration of Independence. They didn't even read the first sentence. Because in the first sentence of the Declaration of Independence, it says, this nation was created in the name of nature and the God of nature. What does that mean? Nature is Mother Earth. God of nature is Father Sky. This is exactly what the Indians live by. We lived here from Mother Earth and Father Sky. And yet, we left the mother out of the equation. And now, we're destroying the mother of our own foundation, and this is why we're facing our own extinction at this point. It's time for a change in our belief system, bring the science back in, and I say, okay, we can plot where this has been. We went into the spiritual realm with monotheism. We came into balance with deism. This should give you a, a few names again. I mentioned a couple. Who were the deists? George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, Thomas Paine, and the list goes on. This country was founded by deists, and this is important, why? Because the new science is the science of deism. The new science says there's a spirit, 
and there's a material world. You cannot separate the two. They are one and the same. But we left the balance point because at this point in 1859, Darwin gave us the scientific theory, and that's when we started to realize that bodies were composed out of DNA. And we hit the bottom of materialization in 1953 when we said, I know who you are. You're a genetic automaton. Genes control who you are. You happen to be like a backseat passenger in the vehicle of life, and you're sitting in the back of your own body going, geez, I wish it would go left, and sometimes it goes right. Uh, that's when you have to figure out you're not even in the front seat driving the vehicle. But the important understanding about this is that's where we were in 53. But look what happened when we hit around 2001 when the Genome Project was introduced. You say, well, what was happening? We started to go toward more spirituality. I said, how do you mean? What, how do I know that? And here's the point. By the time the Human Genome Project was done, listen to this fact, more than 50% of the population would seek an alternative, complementary, integrative medical healer over a conventional allopath. And why is that important? Because all of that is energy. All of that is spirit. That's the new healing mode. And we're moving out of the concept of being a physical, mechanical body and moving into the new realm of that you are a spiritual person enjoying a physical reality. And that when we understand that, you'll understand how your spiritual reality is giving you your biology and the world that you live in. So I say, so where do you think we're going? Where do you think the next dot on this little map is going to find itself? Guess? Okay, if you can't guess, We'll see where it's going. Back up to the midline. We're going up to the balance point, matter and spirit. We're going back to the understanding of the Native Americans who told us we were here to tend the garden, that we're here to live in harmony with nature and with each other, that this whole planet is a garden and we should be experiencing it as such without having destroyed the foundation upon which we stand. A new belief system is arising. The answers to the question is how do we get here? As the Indian said, we got here from the physical character of Mother Earth blended with the energy and spirit from Father Sky. But we also got here through adaptive mutation, so it wasn't an accident. We were created as part of a balanced system by nature. Why, uh, why are we here? Well, as the Indians said, we're here to tend the garden and at the same time acquire awareness because it's through that awareness that allow us to stay on this planet without completely undermining the foundation which the earth provides for us. And I say, how do you make the best of it? And the answer is the Indians said, we live in balance with nature, and we learn to evolve our technology to create the smallest footprint possible so we can survive on this planet. And now I'm going to give you the last and most important understanding. When I talked to you before about evolution, uh, it was always the concept of a Darwinian theory where evolution was a continuous process and that it just goes on imperceptible changes over millions and millions of years. This is totally false. Evolution is not a continuous process. It never worked that way. Evolution has stop points and start points. And the significance about that is if we understand what the stop and start points are, then we can understand where we're going. So you want to know where we're going? Here's how it works. We started out the first level as bacteria. That's the only cells that were here. And over millions of years, bacteria learned to come together and form little colonies with a membrane around them, a little colony of bacteria. Why? Because two can live as cheaply as one. And that the more bacteria that started to live in harmony, the easier it was for them to work together to create a surviving situation. And ultimately, what that bacterial colony evolved into was something called the amoeba. When you look at the amoeba as a cell, it's actually a community of bacteria. But the amoeba is the same cell that you're made out of. And what did amoebas do? When amoebas completed their evolution, which is the evolution of community, the amoeba became a single entity. And then what did that single entity do? Hook up with other single entities to create colonies and communities. And then they ultimately led to humans. Yes, you are a community of 50 trillion amoebas. Uh, yeah, but you became a unity. Yeah, but what happens when you become a unity? Oh, you hook up with other units to form a colony. And then what do you do? You hook up again to form the big community called humanity. The evolution that's in front of us right now is the evolution of humanity, not the evolution of the human. We already did the evolution. It's not us changing. We maxed out. And if you understood your full power, then you understand how you are creating the planet as it is. But I say, what's the next level of evolution? 
It's not the evolution of the human body. It's the evolution of a super organism called humanity. Humanity, that's where seven billion individuals come together and live in one body. And so we are actually a body creating a bigger body. The previous evolution, 50 trillion cells learned to live in a community. We call that one the single entity called the human being. The current evolution is a human being, or actually seven billion human beings, coming together in one giant community, forming humanity. It's the humanity is the superorganism that we have to learn is coming to this planet. Each one of us, each human, is a cell in the body of something larger. And if I say, well, what's the status of humanity in today's world? I go, geez, I, I hate to tell you this, but humanity is suffering from a, a bad case of autoimmune disease. I said, what does that mean? Well, autoimmune disease means self-destruction. When you start to have cells in your body fight with each other, it undermines the system and you get autoimmune disease. And when I look at humanity, I say, yeah, we're facing autoimmune disease because the cells, the humans, are still fighting with each other without recognizing we're all part of one living organism. When we understand this truth, then there will be a new world. And it's happening right now and it's happening very fast. And it's falling apart. So let me just leave you with this last couple of minutes and say this. The world as we know it is ending. And this is a good sign. Because if it doesn't end, we're going to go extinct because that's already a given. The systems are falling. The economy is crashing. Governments are crashing. H academia is coming to be useless. Healthcare is essentially useless. In a sense, the amount of money and amount of sickness. All the systems are falling down. What I want you to recognize is do not be afraid when the system is falling down for a very important reason. If it doesn't fall down, we're going to die. So basically it says this. We are in a stage of creating a new world based on new beliefs and the ones that I've mentioned right here. But how can you do that? Not with the existing systems. The existing systems are the cause of the problem because they're carrying the old beliefs into the future. What we need to do is recognize the existing systems crash and when the existing systems crash, then we are building a new world and a new evolution. And you are the cultural creatives who are thinking your way into a new, more sustainable, more viable future than what we have. So keep up your work, keep up your exercises, and do not lose your faith and your hope because we are on the path of the greatest evolutionary event ever seen on this planet, the convergence of all humans into one living system to share the garden that God gave us. So thank you and Godspeed on your destination. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.